Victory Family Church. How we doing? Well, it's so good to see you today. Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is TJ, and I'm a part of our teaching team here, and so honored that you are here today. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5, because that's where we're going to be at today. Uh, as you're turning there, I want to remind you that next Sunday is Mother's Day. And so, uh, first of all, you're welcome for the reminder to get your mom something this week. Uh, but also, we would just, we'd love to see you. We'd love for you to come and to, to hang out with us next, next week. Bring your family with you. We're going to have lots of just cool stuff outside and in the lobbies, just opportunities for you to be able to uh, just celebrate your mom next week. We're continuing a series today on the fruit of the Spirit. And if you'll remember, so far we have talked about love, we have talked about joy, and today we are going to be talking about peace. Everyone say peace. Peace. Yeah, Mark chapter 5, and I'm going to start reading in verse 21, and I'm going to read a large portion of scripture to start us off today. Is that okay? It's good with four people down front, and it's good with my brother in the, in the balcony. Okay, come on. Mark chapter 5, starting verse 21. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Everyone say peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand hand, and said to her, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this today. So he said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and, they, and told them to give her something to eat. Are you still with me? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word today. I ask that you would use your word to challenge us, to encourage us, and to make us more like you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Uh, this might be a bit of a weird question, but have you ever wondered what hell is like? I, I think there's, I think, Scripture probably has a number of things to say about this, but, but, but I think that in my 30, 33 years, almost 33 years of living, I've discovered a few things that are potential like possibilities in hell. I think that hell might be uh, just sweeping carpet floors for all of eternity. And I know that seems very specific, but I, I worked at Furs Dining when I was in high school and it was all carpet and you had to like sit there and sweep into, and it's impossible. It goes the opposite direction. It doesn't actually work. I think hell might be standing in lines that never end. Because I don't mind lines as long as they lead me to something awesome, right? But I think hell might just be like you're in this really long line and you turn a corner and it's just more line for all of eternity. That's what hell is. I, I don't know. I think, I think hell's probably going to have cats everywhere. I think that's probably what's going to be. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. No, I do. I think I've discovered the primary event of hell. I think that hell is probably going to be where you are in, in traffic on a four-lane highway and the lane that you're in is always the lane that is moving the slowest. Guys, that's so frustrating, 
right? And there's been times where I've been like, I've been in traffic and I'm, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to stay in this lane. I'm locked into this lane. I believe in us. I believe in this lane and we are going to stay here. And then we're like, every other lane is moving but us. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like, what is up there? What is happening? And so finally I see an opening and I move over into one of the other lanes. And the moment I do that, <laughs> that lane stops and the lane I was just in starts going 75 miles an hour, right? It's so... The, the feeling that I get in that moment is the opposite of peace. And peace is what we're talking about today. Peace is the third characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. And if we're honest, peace probably is the one that feels most impossible to experience in our day. Right? I mean, we, we live in an anxious world. And we're anxious about everything. If you watch the news for two seconds, the anxiety of our world is going to attach itself to you. We're anxious about going in public. We're anxious about the weather because it's springtime and we never know what the weather is gonna, what the weather is gonna be like. We're anxious because we have so many things to do and not enough time to do it. It feels impossible to have peace. And yet, you cannot read scripture without getting the sense that peace is a reality that we are invited to participate in. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter, chapter four, verse six, and we talked a little bit about this about a year ago in our series on the book of Philippians, but he says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Man, I love this scripture. And I'm grateful for it. I quote this in my life often because I need it. I believe it. I mean, I believe that a life that is lived in relationship with Jesus is a life that can experience peace even in the most difficult of circumstances. But I just wonder if there's anyone else besides me who has ever had an experience like this. Father, thank you for your presence. I'm worried about tomorrow. And so I pray that you would give me peace. Help me to rest, help me to sleep well, so that I can wake up refueled, ready to attack the day with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we spend the next four hours wide awake, <laughs> laying in our bed, because we are still worried about the thing that we were worried about before. And so I wonder if I can submit something to us today that maybe the problem is not our prayer. Maybe the problem is our pace. And, and don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that our prayers are not powerful and effective. Prayer is the most powerful tool that we have as a follower of Jesus. I just wonder if sometimes we use prayer as an excuse to pass on our responsibility rather than an invitation to practice a way of life that will actually produce peace in our lives. Because the Apostle Paul, he continues in verse 9 in Philippians 4. He says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now, I've said this before, but the truth is, is peace takes practice. And I just don't think we have practiced peace very well. God, give me peace as we keep scrolling on our phones. God, give me peace as we keep filling up our already jam-packed schedule. God, give me peace as we neglect our spiritual disciplines of prayer and scripture reading and fasting in community because we have too many other things going on to spend time doing those things. God, give me peace, but don't ask me to change my pace. And if we look at the central text of our series, Galatians 5, where we see the fruit of the Spirit, we see that pace is actually connected to all of this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, oh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where's my church kids at? Come on, somebody. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us, here it is, Keep in step with the Spirit. That's pace. That's where we are committing ourselves to live at the pace that he sets for us and not the pace that we set for ourselves. And the pace that he wants to set for us is often so different than the pace that we're trying to live at. 
I mean, I'm so busy that I'm, I'm like a minor inconvenience, like losing 10 car spaces in traffic makes me want to throat punch somebody, right? <laughs> and it's not, and it's not even that I'm busy. I mean, busy is not the problem. If you're busy, welcome to planet Earth. Like everybody is busy. We're all busy. We got a lot of things going on. Busy is not the problem. Even Jesus was busy. We'll see that in a second. Jesus was busy. Busy is not the issue. But it is dangerous when we let busy make us hurried because it is hurry that is the enemy of peace. Christian philosopher Dallas Willard, he said it this way, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he points out that some psychologists have actually begun to diagnose people with something called hurry sickness. And there's one book on the topic that gives us three symptoms of hurry sickness. Number one, you leave church before the announcements because you have to, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> Stop. Don't encourage me. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Some of you are really offended. <laughs> but I don't know. I, like one day, Stephen, that joke is going to be old, but that day is not today. The, the, that, today, that joke is not old. No, no, no. Okay. Hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. One of the symptoms of hurry sickness. You change grocery li- lanes because the other lane's moving faster than yours. Number two. You change car lanes leading up to a stoplight because of the number of cars in each lane. And number three, you multitask to the point of forgetting one of the tasks. Guys, when I read that for the first time, I had never felt more seen in my entire life. That's, and unfortunately, hurry and peace are incompatible because hurry has the ability to disconnect us from our life source in God that enables us to experience the fruit of the Spirit in the first place. I mean, mean, think about the imagery of our entire series. The week one, John 15, we talked through this imagery. We see here on the left, left side of the screen, that is the vine. And according to John 15, according to scripture, who is the vine? It's Jesus, Jesus is the vine. From the vine, you have the branches. According to scripture, who are the branches? We are the branches, and the imagery is pretty clear. If the branches don't stay connected to the vine, they are not able to be healthy and grow and produce fruit. And so if we are living at a pace that does not allow us to regularly stay connected to Jesus and spend time with Jesus and be with Jesus and develop our relationship with Jesus, then we will not experience the peace that life with God brings. We need need a new pace. We need a new pace. If only there were someone who could show us that type of pace, right? Like a, like a peace doctor or like a peace professional or maybe like a prince of peace. Here's what I I want us to consider today. That it is the pace of Jesus that invites the peace of God. It's the pace of Jesus that invites the peace of God. And I think if we look at the, at the life of Jesus as we see in scripture, I think that we could describe the pace of Jesus with one word, and that word is unhurried. Which brings us back to our passage in Mark chapter five. Yes, that was just my intro. <laughs> Buckle up. So, so Mark, Mark five, Jesus is busy. We see that Jesus, he spends an entire day teaching a large crowd of people. After he's done teaching, him and his disciples get into a boat to go to the other side of the lake. Jesus is tired, so he decides to take a nap, and a storm comes against the boat. Most of you know the story that that Jesus is woken up by his disciples, and he gets up and he calms the storm, and about that time, they get to the other side of the lake. As soon as they hit the shore, there is a guy who is possessed by by a legion of demons who runs up on them, and it's this really weird scenario where Jesus casts the demons into a herd of pigs who then throw themselves off of a cliff and the people in the village are like, those were our pigs. And so they ask Jesus to leave. That's essentially what happens. And so Jesus and his disciples get back in the boat. They head back to the other side that they just came from. And when they get there, there is another large crowd of people waiting on Jesus. Now, just describing all of that to you, I feel exhausted. Imagine how Jesus is feeling in that moment, right? And so in this crowd, there is a man by the name of Jairus. Everyone say Jairus. And Jairus has a 12-year-old daughter who is on her deathbed, and so he asks Jesus to come to his house to heal his daughter, which is kind of a big deal. So Jesus says yes, and they start heading in that direction. And here's where the story gets really interesting. Are you still with me? There's this woman in the crowd, and on the way, this woman in the crowd decides that if I can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she's been sick for 12 years, 
She's been dealing with a sickness for the entirety of how long Jairus' daughter has been alive. For 12 years, she's been sick, and if I could touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed. And she presses through the crowd. She tries to go unnoticed. She touches the hem of his garment. She is healed in that moment, and then Jesus stops. He stops. He stops moving towards a girl who might die at any moment. He stops, likely making Jairus' heart sink because every moment that Jesus is not moving towards his house is a moment that his daughter might not make it. Jesus is busy. Jesus has a lot going on. Jesus has somewhere incredibly important to be. And yet Jesus stops. And he says, who touched me? Because if you're living at the pace of peace, If you're living a life that is unhurried, what you'll find is that you are interruptible. Which is really challenging for me. I'm preaching to myself this morning. It's challenging for me. Because I don't know about you, I hate interruptions. I'm a bit of a planner. I like to plan my day. And I I like to, like if things don't go according to my plan, if something interrupts my plan, I can get a little bit irritable and a little bit anxious. And so there's times where I can sense this and I can feel this in my life where I'm, I'm anxious because I've got, I've got a plan and I don't like to be interrupted. And so guys, listen to me. Guys, I want to help you, okay? I want to help you. Pastor Adam helped some of you who are about to like do your registry with your fiance a couple weeks ago. I want to help you. I want to give you some advice. There's going to come a time where you're going to pull out your phone and look at your calendar and realize like on a Friday evening, you're going to realize that you don't have anything to do that next day. And it's extremely rare. And so because it's so rare, you're gonna get so excited. And you're gonna mentally plan your entire day. You're like, man, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go to the donut shop, I'm gonna get a cinnamon old fashioned and a jalapeno sausage roll. Come on somebody, that is heaven on earth. And then I'm gonna go to the gym because I need to counteract what I just ate, right? Because that's why you go to the gym so you can eat bad things. And, so, and, then, and then you're gonna go home and you're gonna, right? You're gonna do some yard work, you're gonna change the oil in your car, you're gonna go smell the lumber in Lowe's. I don't know what you're going to do. Like you're just going to, you're going to plan your day and you're going to be so excited for that day. And then some point in that day, in the middle of all the things that you're doing, your wife is going to interrupt you. She's going to look at you and she's going to say those six dreaded words. Let's go to the plant store. (laughs) And I know that feels specific. I'm not saying I know this from like experience. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, okay, I'm just saying. And in that moment, you're going to have two options. Number one, tell her to go by herself. (laughs) Please, for the love of God, don't do that. Don't. Don't do that. We will need so much marriage counseling in this place if you do that. Or or option two, you can go with your wife to the plant store. Now, let's be real, okay? Let's be honest. That interruption is not an inconvenience. It's not. It might feel like it in the moment, but all the list of things that you had planned to do that day, those things can wait. That interruption is an invitation for you to spend time with your wife doing something that she enjoys. And when you're living at the pace of peace, when you're living an unhurried life, you will begin to see interruptions for what they actually are. Interruptions are not inconveniences. They're invitations. And my prayer is that you would not live such a hurried life that you're unable to see the places where God is trying to interrupt you so that he can invite you into what he is trying to do in the lives of the people around you. Don't miss those interruptions that God is trying to get your attention with. Jesus was interrupted all the time. He was interrupted by beggars on his way to pray. He was interrupted by two guys who cut a hole in the roof while he's in the middle of preaching to lower their friend down to him so that he might be healed. Even just in our passage, he was interrupted by the demon-possessed guy. He was interrupted by Jairus. He was interrupted by the woman who was sick. He was interrupted from his nap by his disciples. And yet, in every instance, even though Jesus is busy, he's tired, he's got a lot going on, and he's got places to be, He embraces those interruptions for what they actually are, invitations to participate in what the Father was doing in that moment. And so what if living at peace in our lives was just as simple as embracing a pace that allows us to be interrupted and to say, God, whatever you want to do in this moment, I'm here. I've got somewhere to be, I've got things to do, but Lord, I am here and I am yours. Speak to me, use me, interrupt me, all that you want 
because I want to be a part of what you are doing. So if you're unhurried, you'll be inter- interruptible. And so Jesus, he embraces the interruption. He's got somewhere to be, but, but he stops to find this woman. And I can just imagine with every passing second how Jairus' anxiety was probably beginning to increase. Jesus, what do you mean? Who touched you? Everybody's touched you. Like we're in a crowd of people. Like we don't have time for this interruption. We need to get to my house because my daughter might die if we don't get there in time. We see in scripture, this woman, she throws herself at Jesus's feet. She confesses that she's the one who touched the hem of his garment, testifies of the fact that she had experienced healing. And then Jesus looks at her and says this, Mark 5, verse 34. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Everyone say peace. Guys, do you get that? Jesus is living at a pace that not only allows him to live in peace, but allows him to offer peace to the people around him. My goodness, what kind of impact could we have, church, if we left these four walls and we went and lived our lives at such a pace that allowed us to not only live at peace, but to spread peace to the anxious world around us. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, the truth is, in this time, and this woman wasn't actually that important. J- Jairus was. We know Jairus' name. We know that he was a synagogue leader. This woman has just been historically known as the woman with the issue of blood. For 12 years, she was unable to pray in the temple. For 12 years, she had spent every resource just for doctors to tell her that there was nothing that they could do. And, and nobody in their right mind would have stopped for this woman. But Jesus did. And Jesus not only stopped for her, Jesus not only sought her out, but Jesus saw her with enough love and enough dignity to not just pass her by, to not just keep the procession moving, to not just pat her on the head and leave, to not just look past her, but to look her in the eyes and to speak with her and to be fully present with her in that moment. Because if you're living at an unhurried pace, you'll discover that you will be able to be fully present. And my goodness, what a gift that is. A few months ago, and the Lord really kind of convicted me in a moment, and it was at bedtime with my kids. Those of you with young kids, you know that bedtime is not exactly the funnest part of the day. Right? Bed- bedtime can be difficult. And, and on this particular day, man, after like 24 times of telling my kids to get their PJs on and 18 times of telling them to brush their teeth, and then after they brush their teeth, I'm listening to, to all this whining about how hungry they are. I'm starving. Like after you brushed your teeth, you're hungry. Like, are you serious? You didn't even eat a third of your dinner. You had two bites. And now, of course, you're hungry after you brushed. I was over it. I was over it. And so I finally got them in bed and turned off the light. And as I was about to leave the room, Piper says, Dad, will you stay in here while we fall asleep? And... I don't know, maybe this is too honest and vulnerable. Some of you are going to judge me for this. I could have thought of like a hundred different things I would have rather done in that moment than stay in that room. But for whatever reason, I stayed. And uh, I I sat at the edge of Piper's bed and I reached into my pocket to grab my phone. And to my horror, my phone was not there. (laughs) Which meant I was going to have to sit there with my thoughts. And honestly, I almost went and grabbed my phone, but I didn't. I stayed and I, and I listened to my girls fall asleep. And eventually I directed my attention towards the Lord, towards God's presence that was with me in that room. And tears started running down my face as I just became overwhelmed with gratitude over the goodness and the grace of God in my life. And I realized in that moment that my God had given me an incredible gift of simply being able to be fully present in that moment. Guys, we're not fully present to anything anymore. We're always multitasking. We're always in our phone scrolling. We're always looking past the people that we're talking to, thinking about what we have to do next, where we have to be next, who we need to talk to next. And what if living at peace in our lives was just as simple as as embracing a pace that allowed us to just be fully present to God and fully present to the people around us. What if that's what it looked like to have peace? And so here's the challenge for you today. Are you ready? This is fresh revelation. This is straight from God. This is like gonna blow your mind. Are you ready for this? Here's the challenge. Slow down. Slow down. And I can see it on your face. Some of you are like, I want my money, my money back. That's it. That's, that's where this whole sermon was headed. I listened to you for 25 minutes and you're telling me to slow down? 
this, who's this guy think he is? He don't know my life, clearly. He don't know the things that I need to do. Honestly, my biggest fear coming into today is that this would just be a sermon that you listen to and that you kind of laugh at and you're like, yeah, that's not possible. And then you just continue on into the hurried life that you were living before. But yes, that is the challenge today, to slow down. And honestly, listen, I want to be clear. You can be busy and unhurried. You can. We're busy. Like, we've got a lot on our plate. I mean, so many of you have so many things to do. People are depending on you. You can have a lot on your calendar and still live at a place where you are unhurried, where you are at peace and rest in your soul so that you can, so that you can embrace what God is doing in those moments. So yes, let's slow down. In Mark 5, it seems that Jesus slowing down caused J. Iris' daughter to die. But the reality is, is Jesus has power over death itself. And he does not work on our timeline. And so even though it seemed like he got to Jairus' house late, he was right on time. And so he gets to her house and he, and he gets to the house and, and everybody's crying. And he's like, why are we crying? The, the girl, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And everyone laughs. And he's like, get out, which I think is kind of a boss move from Jesus. Like, get out of here. And he goes into the room and he lays hands on her and, and she is raised from the dead. And I just, man, as I read this, I couldn't help but think that maybe some of you feel this way about slowing down. You think if I slow down, things are going to die. If I slow down, things are going to fall through the cracks. I, I can't slow down. I've got too many things to do and I have too many people who are depending on me. This is not realistic for me. I cannot slow down. But I just think sometimes we fail to remember that we serve a God who has power over death and we serve a God who does not work on our timeline and we serve a God who can maximize our time when we'll let him be the Lord over it. So yes, slow down and trust him with the things that you need to accomplish. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I, I don't know what, maybe, maybe slowing down for some of you is, is really is just as simple as the fact that you're too busy. You've got too many things going on and you just need to lock in with Jesus this week and figure out some ways that you can pull some of those things off of your plate. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you need to, be, to stop being so proud and, and be willing to ask for help when you need help. Maybe some of you, you've neglected your spiritual disciplines and you haven't spent time with Jesus and it's not even that you're too busy, it's just that you're too distracted. Let's be real, right? So many times we're like, how you doing? Man, I'm busy, I got a lot going on. And we're like, I'm too busy to spend time with Jesus. I don't know, I, don't, I just think actually we're not too busy for that. We're just too distracted with things that don't actually matter that much. So maybe for some of you, it's just about removing some distractions. Maybe some of you need to turn your smartphone into a dumb phone. Google that. There's like, you can change your settings to where it's not as distracting as before. Maybe some of you need to remove your TV from your living room. Put it in your closet, I don't know, so that you can be more present with your family in the evenings. Maybe some of you need to learn how to say the word no, N-O, create some boundaries, stop people pleasing all the time. But maybe some of you even need to plug your phone in in the other room when you lay down for bed, right? You plug it in and it's on your nightstand and so you lay down in bed and you're like, I'm just gonna look at Facebook for two minutes and like two hours go by and you're like, well, I was supposed to read my Bible, I was supposed to connect with my spouse, but I didn't do that. So I guess it's time just to go to sleep right now. Maybe you can plug your phone in in the opposite room. And I hear the pushback. Some of you are like, well, I use my phone as my alarm. Go to Amazon and, and type in the search bar, alarm clock, A-L-A-R-M-C-L-O-C-K. It's this ancient technology where you put this thing on your nightstand and it, it tells the time and you set it to go off at a certain time and it's super loud and annoying and it wakes you up. It's fantastic. I don't know. I don't know what slowing down looks like for you. I don't know what eliminating distractions looks like for you. That's for you and Jesus to figure out, okay? I just know that it was my mission to stand up here today and to challenge you to slow down. And not just to slow down so you can have a bunch of room on your calendar, not just to slow down so that you can be lazy and do nothing, but to slow down so you can do the most important thing. And what's the most important thing? Well, remember the imagery of our entire series. Branches that don't stay connected to the vine can cannot produce fruit. If you are living at a pace that does not allow you to regularly spend time with Jesus and practice the presence of Jesus and be with Jesus and remain in Jesus, then your pace is not sustainable for your spiritual life in God. Because it's the pace of Jesus that invites the peace of God. So let's figure that out. What does that pace look like for you? What is what does slowing down look like for you? What, 
What distractions can you eliminate so that you can slow down? Even when you're busy and you got a lot going on, you got a lot, but you can live from an unhurried place in the depths of your soul so that you can participate in what God is doing. Father, we love you. God, we're thankful for the peace that you give. God, my prayer all day has been that that while this message may be challenging for some, God, it would not be condemning for anyone. God, I pray that no one would feel condemned because of the ways that they have failed to live at a pace that allows them to spend time with you. But God, I pray that we would be challenged today to alongside your spirit make some changes in our lives that allow us to be with you so that we can experience the fruit of the spirit, especially peace in our lives. God, I thank you for the grace that you give. I thank you that there's so much grace in this, Lord, that there is no shame, that as we try and as we fail and as we try again, there is so much grace. So God, let your grace drive us and motivate everything that we do as we seek to live at a pace that allows us to lock in with you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, if you're here today and you're not following Jesus, For you, the issue in your life is not necessarily about your pace, but it's about your direction. You're not living in the direction that Jesus has for you. You're not not following him at all. You're living for yourself. You're living in sin. Today, you want to change direction. I hope you understand that God loves you more than you could ever imagine. Jesus came and he died on the cross for your sin so that you can have life and hope through him. If you want to... If you want to say yes to Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, ask him to forgive you of your sin today. Would you just lift your hand in the air right where you're at? I'd love the opportunity to pray with you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I see hands over there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I see that hand. Thank you. Can we pray this prayer together as a family? Say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Today I trust you. I give you my life. I surrender all that I am. And I choose you because you first chose me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for jumping on our YouTube page today. Uh, My name is Adam, this is my wife, Christy. We pastor here at Victory Family Church. We talk about family a lot, and we just wanna say uh, welcome to our family. Even if you're online, you are still a part of our family. We'd love for you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel and stay in touch with us. Uh, Hopefully, the content here will help challenge you, encourage you, grow in your relationship with the Lord, and maybe even make you laugh a little bit along the way. So love you, grateful for you, thanks for joining us.